All right, welcome to this uh, Skill Me Up CloudMaker Expert Talk on Microsoft 365 Data Protection and Classification. My name is Dwayne Natwick. I am one of your speakers for this talk, and I am a Microsoft MVP and a Senior Cloud Training Architect at Skill Me Up and Ops Agility. I do a lot of authoring, uh, blog writing, as well as course content and these talks for Skill Me Up, uh, as well as I'm a Microsoft Certified Trainer and a Regional Lead for that program. You can uh, can reach out to me and uh, and request to to uh, link uh, request to link in. Uh, connect with me or uh, reach out to me on Twitter. I'm generally pretty active on those platforms. And I'm Liam Cleary. Um, I work for myself now. I am also a Microsoft MVP, but specifically in Office Servers and Services, which it's now called, it used to be just SharePoint, which was much easier. Um, and I'm also a Microsoft Certified Trainer. Uh, you can reach out to me at my web, which is shareplicity.com or my blog site. I'm known as Hello, it's Liam. That's my name. A quick two second one that came from me and answering the phone. I would answer the phone and say, Hello, it's Liam. And so that's my brand that I now have. So feel free to reach out to me, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, etc. All right, Liam, why don't you talk about what we're going to discuss today? Yeah, so today we thought we'd focus on some of the challenges, uh, especially which is more apt around where we are now with remote working and kind of some of the issues that we face and then kind of flow into some of the protective capabilities that we have in Microsoft 365 that can kind of help us. Because, of course, when we're working at home, just like in the organization, one of our biggest issues or risks has been data dissemination, leaving the organization, etc. And so we'll focus on data loss prevention. And we'll talk about how those policies can protect the users and the organization. And then we'll jump into data classification, which kind of joins data loss prevention a little bit. And then we'll look at how data classification can protect those same users and the organization. So you'll join those two things together, DLP, data loss prevention and data classification. All right, so like Liam said, you know, the important thing before we really jump into data protection and classification, it's important to understand some of the challenges within the remote remote user environment that pertain to those areas. So let's let's dive into that first. So as as many of you listening to this probably are, you know, know that, you know, become the remote work has become really important uh, for businesses really to remain viable in 2020. But besides the need and the requirements that have been brought on by uh, by the global pandemic that's been taking place this year, uh, there are many factors that make workforce mobility an intriguing option to both the organization and, and to the user environment. Allowing employees to work from anywhere uh, broadens the geographic reach to your organization. So you have the ability to decrease travel costs uh, when implemented correctly. And it also allows organizations to uh, maintain business continuity by not relying on on-premises resources within a typical office structure. In addition for users, working remotely allows more flexibility in their work schedules. It creates a better work-life balance and not having to commute to an office also increases their efficiency and their availability their availability to work in flexible hours and potentially be more productive. Uh, additionally, for the organization, it also broadens that talent, the potential talent pool that they can find workers uh, that within their environment. And it and studies have shown that offering a remote work environment to an employee also show also helps to increase employee retainment and satisfaction. So as we talk about remote work, there's generally two different factions within uh, that mobile remote 
workforce enablement. And we talked to it, talked about it a little bit in the previous slide, and that's the organization and the users. And to consider that strategy, you need to understand the, what these contributors are and what the, the effectiveness is on their workforce and how their perspectives help to shape how that mobile how that mobile work environment uh, is handled and evolves. Uh, you know, users really all they care about is how they is getting access to their files when they need it, getting access to their applications, how they're going to work, and and that it is readily available and accessible quickly when they need it. While the organization needs to maintain the confidentiality and integrity of their environment. They want, they need to support the users uh, with maintaining availability, but also maintaining security of the access of access to data, as well as access to uh, company resources. While also there could be also compliance requirements, not, you know, for both the organization as well as maybe regulatory compliance. And then they one of the largest challenges which we won't talk about in this in this discussion is also bandwidth needs and the access to the internet audio and video as as everybody knows there's many different uh different ways to collaborate these days as well so you know all of those go into there and as we go through this talk we're going to talk probably talk a lot more about probably the first three or four on the slide in how data protection and data classification all intertwine within those uh, those capabilities within the organization. When a organization as well then with the organization and the user environment uh, and if they aren't handled properly then we start to get different threats that come into come into the user environment and a lot of that has to do with potential uh, shadow IT because users are frustrated with how uh, how things are being, you know, how the corporate resources are, are being utilized for access. So they start to utilize other other resources through uh, through cloud software, you know, available cloud software or uh, or other media in which to uh, to chat with uh, with users within the organization or external to the organization. Uh, personal devices and data leakage are really important as we talk about uh, the data protection and data classification as well. So, uh, and to remediate and to handle those, those we're going to talk about uh, talk about that further on as we go through this presentation. And then finally, around remote work, we have obviously a lot of tools that are available uh, within the environment, and uh, and as we'll focus on here going forward in this presentation microsoft 365 is a very important tool for remote workforce enablement as well as for data protection and classification and all the tools and capabilities around that help to build upon how we secure our workforce and how the uh, how data data is protected uh, within our environment so what is data loss prevention and let's let's talk about that a little bit more detail and uh, how that how data loss prevention or dlp uh, what it is and how it works so first off is how it works and as people add and change documents on their sites you know search engine scan content and they can search that content for later as that, as that content's changed. While this is happening, the content is also scanned and sensitive and there's sensitive information and checks to see if that information, share, uh, information is shared. And any sensitive information then that is found is stored securely within those search indexes uh, so that they, then the compliance team has the ability to access it. And that's, you know, and then as the DLP policies are created, then that you then asynchronously run those policies and query those indexes that have been created within the data. So this is checking those 
those searches frequently for any addition, any new content that match policies and applying those actions within those policies. And then DLP from there can take that policy and notice, notice whether that policy is compliant. And if a person, such as if a person adds a credit card number to a document, it may cause a block in access to that document automatically. But if the person removes that sensitive information, it can undo that. And then the next time that uh, that file is accessed, uh, then it won't be blocked because that sensitive information is no longer there. So that's overall, you know, that's really how a data loss prevention system is going to work. It's going to continually pull that inf pull that data that's tagged with the DLP policy and look for certain triggers within that within that data to uh, to make sure that sensitive data is not being exposed to somebody that does not have access to it. So what can data loss prevention do? Uh, so the key things here is uh, is that it identifies that sensitive information across the many locations and you know keep you know key Microsoft 365 services that it does this on is you know Exchange Online, SharePoint Online, OneDrive for Business, Microsoft Teams to name uh, to name a few, and those are the key ones that obviously most of uh, organizations are sharing that information. And they're all very tightly wound together in how uh, in how files are shared. You know, if you're sharing something in Teams or uh, you know, it's it's very tied very closely to SharePoint Online. Same with OneDrive for Business. You know, it all has that same uh, similar back end technology that it's utilizing within the SharePoint environment. So it's uh, you know identifying all that information. It's preventing then the accidental sharing of that sensitive information. So you can identify any document or email uh, as uh, that it that contains say uh, personal identify identifiable health health information and uh, uh, don't allow that information to be shared outside of the organization or shared to people and block access to that for certain people that don't have access to it within your own organization and from there it continues to monitor and protect that sensitive information uh, within not just those online versions of exchange sharepoint onedrive and teams it can also uh, it can also integrate with the other Office productivity tools like Excel, PowerPoint, and Word, and apply those DLP policies to continuously modern throughout the entire Office and Microsoft 365 infrastructure. One of the key things around that is it also then helps to uh, helps the user and helps them to uh, to become educated on what information not to put into documents and and what not to share and they start and it helps the, the policies help to enforce if something is accidentally share, shared but they can also then uh, the users also hopefully start to learn and and get educated through the certain help uh, help compliant help uh, notifications within a within DLP where it's going to trigger a you know hey you're about to share something that's sensitive how are you you know do you want to do that or not and it helps to then continue to to educate users on how to properly handle data and then the organization has the ability then to uh, to have to get reports and have reports on what the organization is doing and how they're doing to comply with those DLP policies. And if any users have potentially overridden those policies, if those policies allow overrides, they uh, the organization can get reports and find out and have an audit trail on where that information may have gone. So Liam, why don't you talk a little bit more about how DLP can protect the users in the organization, building upon what I was just talking about. OK, perfect. <clears throat> so obviously it's great to know how DLP works and obviously it flows through constant 
check-in of the data that's been updated and things like that. But what can we actually do with it? I mean, it's great that we have DLP policies, but a DLP policy itself contains a couple of basic things. So the first one is where to protect the content. So the location, is it Exchange? Is it SharePoint? Is it OneDrive? Is it Teams? Is it channel messages? Is it chats? Or even if we're using some of the preview DLP components for Endpoint, is it something on a Windows 10 device? So this is kind of the first thing we have to do. Second is the condition. So there's very specific conditions that we can match. So the content must match this rule before something. So for example, the rule might be configured to look for social security numbers. Um, and then the direction that the content is being shared. So is it internal being shared or external being shared? Because you may have different types of policies that you wish to create depending on where that content's being shared with. And then of course our last option in there is also an action. So this is the automatic action that will take place when the condition is met. So for example, a rule might be configured to block access to a document, then send a, a message as an email to the user, and then for example, a compliance officer. So we also have other actions that we can utilize as well. But those two pieces, the condition and the action, are the actual rule for the data loss prevention policy. Now, what we can do when we create data loss prevention policies is have more than one type of rule. So we create this kind of general location. So we create the policy and then we specify a location. And so the location, for example, could be anything. It could be any of SharePoint, OneDrive. It could be all of them. It doesn't really make a difference. But then we can have very specific rules that match different types of content. So, for example, if you need to comply with specific regulation. So, for example, you may have a policy that detects the presence of HIPAA information, so health insurance information. This policy could then protect HIPAA data across SharePoint and OneDrive and then perform specific actions. But you could also have another rule that would be looking for other types of content other types of sensitive information and then they become different rules and are grouped inside that policy. What we can then do outside of that is when we're looking at the locations, we obviously have very specific places that we can look. So for example, planner is not really one of them, but exchange email is one of the first locations. Uh, then of course we have SharePoint online, which is all of the SharePoint sites and site collections and subsites. Then the OneDrive accounts, that we can go through as well. And then of course we have Teams, Chats and Channels. Now, for example, if you choose to include specifics or exclude specific, and what that means is that when we go into the configuration for location, I can say, go and look through all the SharePoint sites, except this one, or go through all of the OneDrive locations, except this one. Now a DLP policy can contain no more than 50 inclusions and exclusions. So the way it's kind of built in the wizard is you'll select the option and it selects all the ones for you. But if you choose to include and exclude, then you'll need to kind of rein that back in and not just try and kind of drop things in and out. Now, what we can also do outside of that is we can focus on the condition. So the condition focuses specifically on the content. So for example, uh, the type of sense information you're looking for and then the context of that. So who is it being shared with? So for example, in the content for the, for the contains, we can group specific properties and keywords. So think of a Word document. A Word document may have an author, it'll have a date, it'll have the location it was saved, and maybe it has some value that you've associated to it. We can nest those values together to do a very specific type of query. We can also utilize sensitive information types, which are built in by Microsoft. And there's a couple of third party vendors that create them too, but these are predefined regex patterns, algorithms, XML definitions, dictionary keywords that look for things, for example, like a driving license. You know, not, so for example, I'm in Virginia, so it's going to look for DMV, Virginia, driving license, and all these different keywords. And those can be put into the contains. And then, of course, you can manually type values. Then, of course, when it comes to the direction of the content being shared, because really that's what we're trying to protect here. We're trying to protect the data that shouldn't leave the organization. And so we get two core options available to us. One is to only with people inside the organization. 
And then, of course, with people outside the organization. Now, when you're defining these types of policies, you're going to carefully craft which direction you want these to apply. Do you really care that the finance department is sharing data with human resources? Does it really matter? Well, probably not. But is somebody in finance trying to share it with a third party vendor that it shouldn't go to? Well, yes, that's where that data loss prevention policy comes in. So it's critical to be able to understand what type of content you want to capture by either using any method, typed values or information types, and then the direction that it's supposed to go to. Now, when we come to the next part of the rule, there's a difference between uh, if you're doing this, for example, in the older Security and Compliance Center versus the new one. So and we will look at that shortly. So the common action is to restrict access or encrypt the content. So that tends to be the, the most common feature that we enable as an action. So what that means is an end user tries to share something in SharePoint. It gets captured by DLP. DLP literally just changes the icon of the image and blocks access to the content. Now, depending on your need, you can restrict access to the content in three specific ways. So we have restrict access to content for everyone or restrict access to content for people outside the organization. Or if you happen to be using the anyone link, so that's based around external sharing in the tenant. So if you said anybody can get links, then of course we can restrict and block access at that point. So for site content, this means that the permissions for the document are restricted for everyone except the primary site collection administrator, the document owner, and then the last person that modified that. These people can then come back in. So me as the owner, I could come in and remove the sensitive information from the document, or I could go through the process of like unchecking and saying, no, it's OK. When the access to a document is blocked, the document appears with a special policy tip. So one of the things Dwayne talked about was user education. And this is one of the things that you do with a DLP policy is provide a mechanism where an end user can get a message that says, hey, this is why you can't do something with that. Instead of just hiding it from them, it kind of allows them to learn from there. Now, of course, if you're using email, then of course the actions are a little bit different. So for example, we have remove or set headers, so we can remove or set the headers within an email. And then if we happen to be using the preview data loss prevention policies for endpoint protection, uh, which we're not going to focus on, um, that will allow you to audit or restrict activities on the devices that have been connecting to it. So from a high level data loss prevention process, we're able to not only block the content, restrict access to the content, stop it from leaving. We can also then restrict it being utilized on a Windows device if we've chosen that. Now, over the past few months, maybe a year, as I've spent time working with clients, building data loss prevention policies, it's become pretty evident that not everybody knows what the DLP policies do. And the naming convention that it gives you by default doesn't necessarily explain what that policy does. So I wanted to kind of touch on a, I suppose it's a Liam best practice, I suppose, if you want to call it, of, of a suggestion of how you would name these kind of DLP policies that you create. So first off, we have what's referred to as the template. Next, we have obviously some things we've talked about, which is the location, the sharing direction, whether we've enabled policy tips, whether we have blocked or encrypted the data, and whether it's in enabled or test mode. And so the idea being here is that in order for us to make sense and be able to, you know, I've worked in teams before, so imagine I go in, I create some DLP policies, Dwayne comes in after me and he's like, I don't even know what these are doing. He has to click on them and open them and then try and figure it out. So naming conventions can help. So my my idea and thought process is here is that you name them with what they are actually doing. So, for example, two examples here. The template is PII, which is personally identifiable information. So I'm using a sensitive information type. My locations might be different. So SharePoint Exchange. I'm checking for the sharing direction, which is external to the organization. I'm then either showing or hiding policy tips. I'm either blocking or encrypting. If it's Exchange, I'm always encrypting. If it's SharePoint, I'm not encrypting, I'm blocking. And then I have the option of whether it's in test or whether it's enabled. So just as an example, you would end up with a policy that would be PII dash SharePoint dash external dash show dash block dash testing. And then Dwayne could look at it and go, I know what that does now. 
instead of it just saying credit card numbers because you don't actually know what credit card numbers is doing until you get into it. So it may sound like a silly thing, but trust me, it's much easier and it, at least it makes my life easier. So as long as it makes me happy, then I'm okay with that. <laughs> as long as Liam's happy, we're all good, right? That's right. That's right. That's what it is. As long as I'm happy, then everybody's good. <laughs> Um, so there are three locations and places for creating data loss preventions. In actual fact, you'll find the links all over the place. It's a little bit confusing at the moment still. We might as well be honest. I'm sure Dwayne goes with me on this one that when you go into the admin tenant, which you will in a minute, it, uh, if you click a link, it goes here. It might go there. It could change tomorrow. We're not quite sure where it's going to go. But the, the three big buckets are security and compliance center. Now, whether or not that's the new security center or the new compliance center or the old one, it really makes no difference at this point, but you can create it using that one. Um, then there's the it's, new compliance. It's just, it's just Microsoft 365 roulette, that's all. That's right, that's right. It's like <laughs> you spin the wheel and then go, what have I got today? <laughs> like I've got a brand new tenant that I'm using right now, and for whatever reason, it still goes to the old security and compliance center. But if you click the compliance link, it goes to the new one. So who knows? <laughs> Maybe it'll change, I don't know. But I mean, as they're, as they're adjusting it and changing it, we should get consistency across the board. Hopefully, I'm crossing my fingers for that at least. Yep. Um, and then of course the last one, I'm, I'm a trusty PowerShell person. I, I like writing things in PowerShell. And so these are the three core options that we've got. So let's have a look at how we can create some data loss preventions. Sounds good. So let me just share here and make sure I've got my right screen. Uh, screen three. Okay, let me just make sure that shows up. Can you see that, Dwayne? Not yet. Let me stop sharing and see if that works. Oh, okay. Okay, so let me try this again. Uh, are you, you want to share? Yes, I do. There we go. There we go. Okay, perfect. So I've come into a brand new tenant. Um, nothing special about this one. It's just a generic Microsoft 365 tenant. Uh, what I do have here is I am using E5 licensing as well as E3. That doesn't make a difference in some things, but in other things it does. Now, in order for us to access where we're going to create them, uh, we can utilize the security link. Um, and the compliance link. Now, in my tenant, like I said, if I click security, it's going to take me to the old security and compliance center, which is protection.office.com. If I click compliance here, it's going to take me to, it's also labeled security and compliance, but it's actually just the compliance center. Now, what you should be doing is where possible utilizing this one. So the compliance center is the place where you go to create anything that would be a data loss prevention policy or anything that relates to retention, etc. So I'm going to scroll to the bottom because you'll notice there's nothing that really talks about it. And actually, this has been a bit of a, a bit of an issue for a few people that I've been working with where they're like, it doesn't say data loss prevention. And that's because you have to go to the show all option at the bottom and click show all. And then you can scroll down and then you'll see data loss prevention. So Microsoft is trying to be sneaky and hide it away from you. It's like if you can find it, then you've passed the test. So I'm going to click data loss prevention. Now, when we get into data loss prevention, you'll see we have three options available to us, two of which are preview. So I'll give you my tip here. If it says preview, that means it could go away. So don't rely necessarily on those. 90% of the time they do GA and become normal, but just be aware that could change. However, what we do have is this policy option. And even though create policy says preview, which is very confusing, uh, it's not preview, it creates the policy in the same way as it would if it was in the old one. So what you'll see is I have two policies. I have a US financial data and I have general data protection regulation. Now notice I didn't follow the best practice naming convention because I didn't create these. They would automatically provisioned as part of it. But I'm going to create a new policy. So let me click, click create policy. And what we end up with is the ability to choose the type of sensitive data that we wish to utilize. So for example here, I can go into financial, I could change my region to the US, and you'll see I get some options available to me. So for example, if I chose PCI, that's only going to identify credit card numbers. But maybe if I want US financial data, then what I end up with 
is credit card numbers, bank account numbers and bank routing numbers. So maybe that's the one I want to utilize. Now, of course, if we're looking at privacy, I've got PII data. So you'll see that as you click into each one, it gives you the different type of information that it will identify. Now, if what you're looking for doesn't exist, then we can click custom policy, select custom, and then we can go through the wizard of creating that. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose privacy for now, we'll choose PII. And then what I'll do is just click next here. Now, of course, this is where we get to choose the name. So maybe I'm just gonna call it PII test. I know that's not following my naming convention, but we're just gonna go through the flow on this one. So I'll click next. Now, of course, what you'll notice here is there's a couple of extra options available to me for uh, sharing of the information of where it's supposed to go. So what you can see is I've got Exchange, SharePoint, OneDrive and Teams, Chats and Channels, which is what we talked about. And then in preview, we have Microsoft Cloud App Security, which we'll touch on in a moment, and then Devices, uh, both of which, well, the Devices in preview and Cloud App Security requires you to have that under your normal licensing. I'm going to leave them as they all are, but you can see if I scroll to the right here, we can exclude or include. By default, it's set to all. If you don't want to apply this to all, and as a quick best practice, when you're deploying this out, you probably want to reduce the scope of where you put this. And um, because what's going to happen is if you choose everything and then put it in test mode, for example, you're the people that are going to have to look at all the alerts that come through. So maybe isolate sections. I mean, in all fairness, let's be honest, if you work in IT or you're in charge of something like this, you'll know which groups in the business are the ones that are probably sharing data that they shouldn't do. So maybe isolate it down to that group. Now, what we get here is the ability to review and customize and say, OK, I just want to leave it as is. Or what we can do, which is really powerful here, is customize those rules. Now, remember what we talked about in a rule. You have a location and then you have conditions and then you have actions. So what happens now is there's always two rules that get generated by a policy. You get the low volume and the high volume. What that means is, is if we look at the low volume, you'll see some kind of base information that says this is looking for this, this is going to people outside, and this is what's going to happen, notify users. If I go the high one, you can see we get some restrict access, block, etc. So depending on whether it's a low number of identified data versus a high number. So an example of this would be somebody pastes a credit card number in a Word document, that's one instance. But if somebody pastes 20 credit card numbers in a Word document, that would come under the high. So if I wanted to modify the high, for example, I can click here on the edit and then we're able to expand the rule. Now I'm not going to go through and change this, but you'll see we can modify the accuracy level of what it finds by default. All of the Microsoft ones sit between 75 and 85 percent accuracy, which does sometimes bring false positives. And then we have instance counts. So you'll see because this is the high rule that there's it's looking for 10 instances or higher. Whereas if I come back out of this one and go to the low one, you'll see it's looking for one to nine. So you can craft this and have it do different actions based on the quantity. You know, if Joe blogs in the organization, shares one thing with a credit card number in, maybe we don't wanna cause massive problems. We just wanna restrict and let them know. But if someone's doing 50 or 60, then we wanna do something severe. So of course we choose the direction like we talked about. So this is people outside the organization. And of course, when I'm building this, I can obviously add more conditions when I'm in edit. I have exceptions and then I have actions. Now you'll notice we get some extra ones come in now as well. We get restrict access to the content. We've got the Windows devices one, and then we've got third party applications if we happen to be using that. So if I choose restrict access, I'm gonna say only with people outside the organization and I'm gonna block access and sharing. I then get to determine what goes in that notification. So I can say notify these people, I can add extra people, and I can then customize the message that gets sent to them. And of course, this is critical here. I can customize the policy text. This is what gets shown to the end user if they happen to hover on something in there. I'm not gonna leave those as they are. This is one that's up for debate, whether you allow end users to override that. Um, I'm not a great fan of that, um, just because if I something blocks me from doing something and I can override it, I'll just say override and carry on. And then, of course, we can decide whether to do incident reports and then, of course, uh, set the order of the rules that might be created. So if I just click save on this one, 
that means I have my rules now created. I can also add new rules here. So remember, policy, locations, multiple rules, actions, conditions. So click next. Then I get to choose the mode this needs to go in. So best practice tip here for you. When you do it for the first time, put it like this. I'd like to test it out first. It's not going to block anything. It's not going to tell the users anything. It's going to literally populate the reports so that you can then at least see what's going on and look for the false positives. Then when you've done that and you've tweaked the policies, when you're ready, put it, leave it in test mode, check the box and say show policy tips in test mode and then kind of let them see that. And then when you're happy with that, then click yes, turn it on right now. I'm just going to click no and click next and then submit that. Now, of course, that creates the policy. It gets added to the list. The moment it gets created and provisioned, it gets dropped into the pipeline that we talked about for search indexing. So as it identifies the content, then it'll start to apply to the content. Now, of course, one last thing here is there is a connection between these DLP policies and I'm going to jump across to Cloud App Security just so you can see. So if you have Cloud App Security sitting around the edge, you can also, for example, see here it says file containing PCI data. Uh, this is an entry for data loss prevention that somebody was trying to share the Northwing database, an Excel spreadsheet uh, outside from SharePoint Online. So we have multiple protective barriers. So we have this perimeter that's based around application specific like SharePoint OneDrive and Exchange. And then we have Cloud App Security that sits outside of that and protects as things try to leave the organization to other applications. Okay, so let me stop sharing. Okay. All right, I think we're Good. All right. So yep. let let me talk now about the classification of data. Let's go a little bit deeper into into that and some of the naming and everything that we need to take into account. So uh, what you know, there's three main pieces to information protection. It's what you know, uh, which you know under which is your understanding of your data. You know the knowing the landscape and uh, identifying the importance of the content and where the where the that content is located as as Liam had mentioned location is a key point and identifying then who accesses that content and where so it's so a really important piece to uh, to data data protection and data classification is is the organization actually knowing their data if they don't know their data DLP and data classification isn't going to work. It's not going to protect your data if they don't know what they have. So that's really important. And then once you know your data, then you can protect your data. You can apply those protection actions, those policies, uh, in you know, if necessary, enforce encryption, uh, apply restrictions to access, utilize visual markings like uh, confidential and watermarks within your data as well to notify the people accessing that data that you know what the importance is of that data so that everybody is educated and knows the importance of the data as well as then preventing and preventing you know prevention in terms of making sure that data is not shared that in that sensitive information isn't shared like Liam was uh, pointing out with the uh, with the credit card numbers you know notifying uh, and preventing, you know, uh, lists of credit card numbers from being shared in a document and, you know, utilizing then how, you know, that data loss prevention and uh, and endpoint uh, at both the the document level as well as the endpoint level to uh, to prevent the sharing of that data. So let's go a little bit deeper in, into these three areas and first obviously is knowing that data. So knowing those sensitive information types, identifying that you know the sensitive data and what it, you know, using you know built in uh, built in policies, built in uh, you know the built in metadata and search capabilities within 
uh, within Microsoft 365 and you know just within the character recognition and document recognition that is built into many of the, many of those tools and to understand to find those information you know there's there's a typical uh, typical structure to a credit card or to a social security number and many of those uh, many of those sensitive uh, information types of prof uh, personal identifiable information. So, you know, so that can be recognized and that can be, you know, can be those built in capabilities can be used to draw out that information. And then, you know, you, you know, having, you know, the keywords and the confidence levels and the proximity, you know, and understanding uh, how that, uh, you know, what that information is and, and knowing that it's drawing that right information is important to know and to test, uh, like Liam was saying, when you put a policy in place, it's good to test and just see what it's gathering uh, before you actually implement it so that there aren't false positives. And then you can tweak it and make sure that that information, that, that it is drawing the cor correct information based on the file formats that your organization is utilizing. And again, you know, the trainable classifiers, you know, uh, utilizing, again, how that information is uh, is classified and using that information to train and understand what files and what locations those that information may be uh, may be getting pulled from and allow and then continuing to adapt and uh, and structure your policies and classifications based on those based on what's being found within the environment. And I think and it goes one step further as well, Dwayne, yeah. on the trainable classifiers. So what's interesting is every organization I've ever spoke to has custom content that doesn't match the Microsoft mm -hmm. list of stuff. So, for example, a statement of work or an invoice or something else. And so what's nice here, which is really only a fairly new thing, is that we can take a copy of, you know, for example, the invoice, throw it into the classifier, it can train from a location. So, for example, like a, a SharePoint document library of invoices, we can go and train what it is, and then it will then at that point start to recognize custom content that we've never been able to do before, like it never existed. And so now we have that flexibility, especially with like things like SharePoint syntax and Project Cortex that Microsoft have. Like it, that's actually really good now because it means that stuff that you wouldn't necessarily been able to block, we can now block. Right. Yeah, and that day yeah, that's a really good point because yeah, organizations have their own legal templates and things like yeah. that that aren't that aren't uh, that may not be standard standard fare for within the Microsoft environment. So yes, having having those documents and being able to train those documents is very important. And then you know identifying them and creating those sen sensitivity labels and retention labels to classify all of that information within the organization and then utilize the actions that users are taking on them and notify you know, and, and noticing how users are using that information is important to uh, to building to continuing to build those classifications and those policies. So understanding how uh, you know what users are utilizing that for so that so that we have the proper workflow of that information and we're not blocking an important workflow because you know based on you know that that's what the user needs and and what data needs to flow uh, within that uh, within the organization. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and then the protection of of that data is obviously very important and there's multiple ways to protect. Uh, we're, we're focusing a lot, uh, you know, in a moment we'll talk a lot about the the sensitive, you know, the sensitivity labels, but there's also, you know, as we've talked about encrypting of the data, um, you know, using using, you know, a unified labeling scanner uh, utilizing services such as right management, uh, rights management connector, and how you know how all of these protection services kind of work together. You know, you can based on a sensitivity label make sure that that data is encrypted. And like we were talking about the DLP policies and requiring any emails with sensitive data to to also be encrypted or always encrypting emails if you're working in a particular uh, a particular department within an organization. So doing all those things and taking all of those into account 
are very important to uh, to protecting your data. But like I said, the knowing your data at the forefront is of the utmost importance because if you don't know what you what your data is and what your data what might be sensitive on your data, there you know you're not going to protect it properly. And then we'll talk about a little bit here, here about the, the a little bit deeper on the prevention side. And we mentioned data loss prevention, and then there's also endpoint data loss prevention. So, you know, the data loss prevention of the applications and the cloud applications like SharePoint, Online, Exchange, Teams, and preventing the sharing of that content, as we talked about uh, and uh, Liam showed in the demo. Uh, but then there's also that endpoint data loss prevention as well. So how uh, are we utilizing capabilities within a Windows 10 uh, environment and how that information is used then on that device and protected on that device in case uh, that uh, that device becomes compromised from that you know, from a particular user and making sure that that data does not get exposed from there. And then there's a few prerequisites as as uh, Liam stated uh, when he went into his demo environment you know it there are multiple types of uh, of licensing within the Microsoft 365 ecosystem and to have the full access uh, and use of data classification you need one of their e5 tiered uh, tiered services, which is you know, Microsoft 365, E5, Office 365, uh, or add on the advanced compliance uh, or advanced threat intelligence add-ons as well. Uh, so making sure that you have those proper uh, those proper licenses to if you want to utilize and take uh, take advantage of data classification and utilizing sensitivity labels and sensitivity policies. You may need to make sure that you have these proper licenses and if you don't you need to look at upgrading and utilize those capabilities i'd like to always recommend if you're an enterprise you should have an e5 level license there's no reason not to because of everything that you have and you require uh, within your organization for security and protection uh, e5 is is the way to go uh, and then the uh, account you must have the account to be able to create these roles and roles groups must be one of one of four uh, assigned uh, assigned administrative roles, either a global administrator, a compliance administrator, security administrator, or a compliance data administrator. So you need to take those into account as well. So let's talk a little bit more about sensitivity labels and what they do within your environment. So. Uh, the sensitivity labels enforce enforce the protection settings with uh, such as encryption. I mentioned watermarks on the label to you know confidential content, and you know an example here is you know having that confidential label when a document is opened up or uh, or a, an e or that document's attached to an email, and the label itself then encrypts that content and applies that watermark automatically so even if you haven't gone into your particular statement of work document and put in that confidential watermark in there or your legal document it can identify from those uh, from those templates and what we've created within our uh, our policies that this is a confidential document and Add that document with add that confidential watermark within there. Uh, you can again also protect content in Office apps across different platforms and devices as well. So utilizing utilizing the power of the 365 ecosystem and all of the productivity apps and taking and utilizing those sensitivity labels across those apps across third party apps and cloud services. Uh, Liam mentioned the cloud you know utilizing cloud app security. Cloud app security ties into a large volume of cloud applications, not just Microsoft owned, but also third party. So the ability then to, to tie the sensitivity labels into all of that, if there are third party cloud applications that your organization is utilizing, you can utilize that that way as well. Um, you can, again, also extend those sensitivity labels to those third party apps and services 
um, utilizing the information protection SDKs and you then applying those protection settings then to those uh, to those third party apps. And then finally, being able to classify content without uh, using any protection settings, you can simply assign classification to that content that persists with that content uh, when it's used or shared. So you don't need to necessarily have uh, that protection uh, that protection policy in place, you have you have tied that to that uh, and tied that classification to that particular document, and then you can follow that document, see usage reports on that document, and also um, you know choose to apply additional protection settings later on. So what are the components then of the sensitivity label. So the you know, key things here is, is you know, we have the have name and description. Uh, you know, we want to, uh, once we've identified and, and given it a name, we've described what that document is, then we're going to create that sensitivity label and, and provide whether there's going to be encryption on that, uh, on that information, what users, very similar to uh, setting up that DLP policy, it, what users have access, uh, whether you know they have access to confidential information, if they have access to that confidential information, that it is encrypted, what that content is being marked as, uh, what are we, uh, you know, are we putting a watermark in place? Are we, uh, are we uh, providing the additional labels? You know, what are we utilizing that information in terms of, you know, within What's, what what uh, applications such as Microsoft Teams, uh, 365 groups, SharePoint sites uh, for that you know container level classification and protection, and you know and are we labeling the you know setting those labels for you know specific private public or privacy private policy uh, privacy policies, external users access um, access from unmanaged devices. You know different conditions that might be within uh, within the organization and with and where that document resides and where that document is being shared and and being accessed might continue to you know might be factors within that uh, within those uh, that criteria. Um, and then if we have on top of that then any auto auto labeling and we can generate those and label that uh, those uh, sensitivity labels automatically based on the templates we've, we've created or automatically notifying and recognizing the, uh, the type of data that is on that, on those documents to, uh, to label those documents as confidential to, again, apply how that, do how that document's going to be handled in terms of encryption and, and being marked uh, based on those auto labeling configurations. I think what's nice there, Dwayne, is that we don't have to rely on the users then. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I hate to say that, but I mean, like, I, so years ago, I did some work for a bank in the UK and they rolled out a new SharePoint intranet and they mandated that every single document had to have 17 managed property de metadata values assigned every time they saved the document. So you can imagine what happened if, when somebody went in, they create the document and then just pick the first value for everything. So every single document that was ever put in there in, the, in about three months was tagged exactly the same all the way through. And then they stopped and had to redo it. And so the issue was you want to have this great security kind of component thing, but the, at the detriment of the user is just going to do whatever. And so it's a nice way. And so just like you said about E5 licensing, I always tell people in the sessions that I give at conferences, I'm like, just pay the money, just pay the money and get the license and then you don't have to worry about it. It can be targeted to specific locations and it just gets classified. Oh, and that goes back to like what the third slide that I that I showed yeah. with the users versus the organization to a degree and users are going to take the easiest route. And like you said, with with uh, offering offering options to override, right? It's same, yes. yeah, same, same thing, you know, I think of the same thing when I'm talking about conditional access policies. Why is there a, if, if you're if you're flagging something on a conditional access policy, 
why are you allowing it through with access? Why are you just not blocking or doing MFA? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's I don't right. understand why allow is even a choice in there. It should never yeah. be a choice. So same <laughs> same things. Uh, so uh, so yeah. So just to kind of go on to that, that here is you know some of the the pieces around that automatic assignment. You know, in terms of from the client side, uh, you know when a when a document's edited or a email is composed. You know, the, it'll you know so it'll provide you know recommended labels. The user can decide whether to accept or reject the label. Again, you know, uh, best practice is to not is to do it more from a service side and to auto label those policies and apply those automatically. Therefore, you don't get yourself into a compliance issue because somebody's overridden a sensitivity label. Yeah. So do you want to show Liam how to uh, enable a policy here quickly? Uh, indeed, yep. OK, um, it says I'm sharing. Go ahead and initiate it again. OK, oh, there we go. It has an extra box that pops up. Yep. <laughs> OK, perfect. So I'm back in my data loss prevention again, but this time I'm going to scroll down to the bottom here. And I'm going to go to information protection, which is an option that's hidden. Remember, information protection will then take me into what's called uh, labels and label policies. Now, out of the box in my environment, I have a couple of odd ones here. So confidential and highly confidential. I particularly like the one called Project Falcon. I think that sounds amazing. Um, but what we have here is the ability to create a label and then we create a label policy. What we're actually creating when we choose a label is a sensitivity label. So this is a label that we can apply, just as Dwayne talked about, to specific content. So I'm going to come into here and I'll just call this a uh, test label. What I then have is a message that I can uh, display to users and then also a message that can go to admins. Now, of course, you would obviously write a better message than test label message. I'm going to choose next. Now we get to choose where it gets associated to. Now you can see that we've got files and emails and groups and sites. Now this is a new change that came recently where it was all together and now they're able to change that and say, I want to associate it to, for example, just groups, which we're talking about Office 365 groups, which is the precursor to Microsoft Teams. And then of course we've got SharePoint sites. Now that's checked by default because obviously that's one of the things that we want to do. There is some extra steps to enable that if it's not been done in the tenant. I'm not going to go through and do this yet, but there is an extra step that just says enable for documents and uh, in groups and sites. But I'm going to say files and emails, choose next. I then get to choose what the protection settings would be. So let's say a Word document. I'm going to mark the content of the file with something. Maybe I want to encrypt the files and the emails, so maybe I'm going to do everything. So I'm going to choose next, and then I'm going to say configure encryption settings. And what we can do here is predefine what those protection settings would be. So we can assign permissions now. Once again, remember we talked about automatic, so try where possible to remove the decision for the type of content. So if you say let the users assign the permission, honestly, it probably may never happen. So I'm going to change that to assign permissions. Maybe I want to expire the content. So I'm going to say when the label's been applied, they have three days to get to the content, then it will expire. Then of course, I'm going to block it being available offline, which means no one's going to be able to sync it offline. It has to be online. Then I can choose assign permissions and you'll see this kind of weird string down here. These are the permissions. Now these permissions come from rights management which is the Azure rights management piece behind the back of a tenant. And so I can choose and say I want to grant them viewer access. So notice it selects the options. They get view content, they can view the rights, and then they can allow the macros because, of course, if you're looking at a spreadsheet, you may have a macro that you want to execute. So click save. I'm going to then say uh, add all users and groups or I could have chosen individuals. Click save. And then I've then got this double key encryption. Uh, I talked about this with someone the other day. We're not going to go through that one. That involves a whole separate piece of deployment of a different service, uh, but you can double encrypt and then you own that second key. So I'm going to choose next. I've then got content marking. So I'm going to add a watermark here, choose customize. I'm going to make it size 20 
I'm going to say uh, confidential, for example, and I'm going to make that in red and do it diagonal and click save. Now that means that when this content is identified, whether asynchronously or as Dwayne talked about in the office application, so you may or may not know this, but when you create these types of policies, um, the office applications at the moment utilizing the unified labeling client when built in, in real time will scan as people are typing in a Word document. So and at the moment that it identifies something, it can instantly change the document there and then. So once again, we remove the capability. So I'm going to say auto label. I then have conditions so I can say contains. And then, of course, you'll see I can use sensitive information types. So let me just uh, do the ABA routing number, for example. I can then say automatically apply the label, which I want to. I can choose next. And then, of course, if I'm using groups and settings, which I'm not, I can just fill those in, choose next and create the label. This creates me the label and the label only. There's no policy at this point that's been created. Now to create the policy, you'll need to wait for that to kind of show up. And just as a side note, there's always a lag between the creation. So you may not know this, but what you're doing here is creating an AIP label, an Azure Information Protection label, which is in the Azure tenant behind the back of this. So once we have the label, which is here, I can select my test label. This will then render me the details. If I click publish label, you'll see it populates this piece here. Choose next. I can then choose who I want to associate to. And this is critical because when you create the labels, you may only want certain groups of people to have access to that label. I'm just going to say everybody for now. Choose next. I'm going to say apply the test label and require the user to apply all of their emails and documents. I'm not going to provide justification for changing it. I'm just going to force them to do it. And then I'm going to call this one test label policy. Put that into here, choose next and submit. At that point, the label is now visible. And where is it visible? Here, SharePoint Online, OneDrive for Business, Microsoft Teams, Outlook Online, Outlook Client, Word Client. It surfaces itself in all those different locations. So that's as simple as it is to create a sensitivity label. OK. OK, so how can data classification protect? We talk about DLP of how that protects and we kind of saw that. But from a data classification perspective, it's a little bit different. So firstly, if we look at data classification policies, what we end up with is that policies can be applied to content locations and content. So a little bit different here, we can say apply it to this Word document or apply it to this SharePoint document library. And the end user doesn't need to determine the policy or the labeling that's used. So automatic classification can eliminate what we talked about a few moments ago about users just randomly picking stuff that doesn't make any sense. Uh, policies follow the content no matter where they go. And this is great. So uh, think of the use case here. Someone puts a document, they tag it, and then they're like, well, I want to take that somewhere else. They put it on a USB stick and run home and put it in their Linux machine and then try to open it and the document calls home and it doesn't work because it has the protections applied to it. And uh, I did this years ago in a early incarnation of rights management for a shipping company in Greece, believe it or not. They didn't believe me that that's what would happen. And we did it as a use case and put a document on a USB drive and tried that. And then what they did, they opened it on a Linux machine and then shut the Linux machine down and tried to find the document stub to see if they could open it like a whole process that we went through. And you know what? We passed with flying colors and it was fine. And so it works pretty well. And so the policies are to control the document lifecycle. So we classify the content. We can classify during retention. We can then enforce during the lifecycle of the file. And then we can control the retention, disposition and destruction of the content. Now, there are a couple of tools that we can utilize for this. Uh, there's what's called unified labeling. So unified labeling is the Microsoft name that they gave to the labeling mechanism. It used to be called AIP. Now it's MIP. Now it's uh, AIP and labels and sensitivity labels and whatever. But it's unified labeling is the first one. Second one is data loss prevention, which we've already looked at. Third is compliance manager. Um, and then last is retention policies. 
So this will allow us to protect the document from start to finish. So unified labeling is protection of the content that we're working on. Data loss prevention is the boundary to stop it leaving. Compliance manager is we have to meet an organizational need of NIST compliance or ISO 27000 or whatever it is. And then retention is controlling of the content towards the end. Now, when we talk about compliance tools, there are really two compliance options available to us. The first one is compliance manager and compliance manager is a workflow based tool. Microsoft built this, made it available in the service trust portal or now available directly in the compliance center. This allows you to manage regulatory and compliance activities. So, for example, I worked with a, a client of mine recently. They're looking at being NIST compliant. Of course, you know, Microsoft has these great articles that says Microsoft 365 is NIST compliant. It, it is, but your piece of it isn't. And that's the difficulty. You still need to go and enable specific things. Like, for example, I was involved in a there was a data breach in 365, a health organization. Uh, a vendor had been hacked and they stole credentials and hopped in and it was an interesting conversation because I said, well, did you enable this? And they said, well, no, Microsoft said it was all secure. I'm like, it, it is. But if you didn't turn these things on, then we can't really help you <laughs> because we can't we can't get an audit trail. We can't find out what's going on. So the compliance manager uses predefined templates and then you can provide evidence for those compliance tasks. So if you, you know, accept the risk and don't provide something for multi-factor authentication, you provide documentation for that. Compliance score builds on that. This is your ongoing score. It's a pre, it's kind of the new version of what used to be there to begin, which was called secure score. Secure score is your security posture score. Compliance score is your compliance posture score. It's based on Microsoft did their bit. Did you do yours? And if you didn't, here's a whacking great list of all the things that you have to do now and how many points you'll get if you keep doing it. So it and displays. And you need to assign it to and. <laughs> yes, that's right. Start, that's start right. Giving people like, work. <laughs> yeah, because you look at it and you're like, how many things? Whoa, there's loads of things I have to do, you know, and it, and it is. And it's like you look at the Microsoft score and it says 14,600 and something out of 14,600 and something. And then your customer one is zero out of 9,000. <laughs> and you kind of sit there thinking, OK, I have lots to do, but it but it, but it is. It lists all of the solutions. It lists best practices. And what's nice now is when you click into them, it'll take you directly to those locations so that you can then like action those things. And and like you said, Dwayne, assign them to individuals in the organization. I, I think I think it's a great it, it really brings to light what the responsibility is on the organization yes. within the environment. Yeah. Like you said, you know, Microsoft promotes that they have all of these compliances and attestations. And I'm always telling organizations and talking to them that, yeah, OK, it's compliant. You know, if I move to Azure, I'm going to be HIPAA compliant. No, the infrastructure <laughs> will be HIPAA compliant, but there's a lot of other things that you're going to have to put in place or yes. and Microsoft enables a lot of that because you just need to turn on a service here and there possibly. Yep. But yep. there's a lot of things that have to be done from your responsibility standpoint to get there. That's right. I mean, if we take the things you've talked about, so data loss prevention, sensitivity labels, they get flagged in the compliance manager, but they don't tell you what you're supposed to put in. They'll say like, hey, here's some suggestions that we think you might want to do, but you know, it's your organization. Go ahead and do it type thing. Yep. All right. OK. So. Uh, let's 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 wrap things up. Uh, we've been uh, going for a while now, so hope, you know, what we hope to have accomplished here uh, today is that we've you know, gone through a lot of the challenges of the remote uh, the remote user environment and how we can uh, can address some of those challenges with uh, with data loss prevention and data classification and those and those things. You know, it's this, as we said, there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle and a lot of things that have to be. Uh, addressed within your organization to protect your data, protect your users. And we do have some uh, upcoming uh, upcoming talks that kind of take that even a step further into some other services as well. So, uh, you know, so look uh, for our, uh, you know, some upcoming talks that I have with Liam as well as some other uh, other uh, Microsoft 
experts in the environment and how we, how all of this kind of comes together in terms of building your uh, Microsoft 365 and your uh, Azure and your uh, and your overall hybrid infrastructure to protect your data and classify your data and keep your uh, environment uh, secure and protected. So with that, we'll we'll drive that to a, a close. And my name is Dwayne Natwick. And my name's Liam Cleary. So like I said, catch you know the full episodes of Cloud Maker, Cloud Native, and Thinking Cloudy Expert Talks are available on skillmeup.com as well as you can find a lot of them are being posted uh, now on the Skill Me Up YouTube channel. So subscribe to that as well. Uh, the schedule for upcoming talks that uh, that myself and Liam have as well as as well as other uh, other skill me up authors and experts are uh, available on skillmeup.com and I want to thank everybody for listening in to this expert talk and have a great day.